it's um damn you were you set the bar high bro it's it's 11 a.m sydney time for everyone listening it is 7 p.m you're in ohio correct yes yeah and cool john last time we had last time i had you on was last april so roughly nine months ago okay and what i want to talk about you know just if i say a couple the thing that you know, I'm a strength coach down here at Sydney, born and raised in Northeast Ohio. So that's one thing we have in common. Um, it's that work ethic as well about how what you just said, you just start off. You're constantly giving away your time and you're constantly affecting people by the masses. Is th This seems like it's 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 a duty of yours. That's what yeah, you yourself. I mean, it's... um. So there's a couple of things going in that. Number one, I'm just a hard worker by nature. And if I'm not doing something, I just feel like I'm um, wasting my life. So I like to be productive. And the other thing is, is, you know, honestly, in this industry, man, when you get to my age, you got to stay relevant because there's a lot of, you know, young, exciting people coming on board. So, you know, I have to provide value. Um, and if you don't, that doesn't, that's not really just me. That's anybody. If you... In this industry, man, if you disappear for a little while, you don't bring value, then people just forget about you. So luckily for me, I like to stay busy and I like to work hard and I like to get information out there and I like to talk to people and socialize and and do those kinds of things. That man, the adding value bit, it so there's a so the the way the business is set up down here in Sydney at the health club I work at, there's about 35 other strength coaches and we all kind of rent space there. We, we could bring our clients, very nice health club. And when I got there five years ago, you had this group of coaches that had been there for 10 years. And with social media 10 years ago, nobody was using it. Even, and even five years ago, when I started there, I remember these guys, they were more focused on how many sessions they were doing in the gym and not even having any social media um, profiles. When you said, if you disappear for a while and you know, people forget who you are, there's coaches that had been there in my gym for 10 years recently now, not even coaching anymore. And it's almost like they weren't able to adapt with being able to tie the, you know, bridge the gap between the gym, the content, learning social media. And so they just fizzled out. This is something that you've done. Just me watching you grow in the last year. I mean, you, you're a guy that's synonymous with not only performing your own body at the highest level, but also people relying on you to bring them to the highest level. So that alone, watching you this last year, take the social media, the networking component, the content component to the next level. It's like you didn't even struggle. It's almost like it's, you kind of blended that very easily. Well, I had, um, so I remember, when I started my YouTube, which was probably eight, nine years ago, but I only started it to have an exercise index. So I was writing training programs then. And what I would do is if I put an exercise in the training program, I wanted you to be able to see how to do it. I thought this is really good for people because all the training programs I see that they, they don't have that. It's just do three sets of eight here, do four sets of 10 here, but you really weren't sure about the mechanics and things like that. So I have all these videos that are like 10 seconds long or 20 seconds long or 30 seconds long, which were just for an exercise index. And then um, I started seeing all these people on YouTube just doing really well. And I kind of stopped and I thought to myself, wait a minute, man, this is a great tool for me to communicate to a lot of people. So rather than me sit around and complain about social media like some of the older guys do about how they don't like it, I thought, no, man, this is a great tool. Think about all the people I can reach now. And, you know, I don't really have any gimmicks or anything, but I can sure as heck just continually pump out good information. And hopefully people will appreciate that. And then the same thing happened with um, – I used to have uh, – I was a little nervous about Instagram. I thought, now, why would you just want to just post pictures? Like, that's weird. There's no real dialogue like on Facebook. And my friends just kept hounding me and hounding me. They're like, man, you got to do this. Um, yeah. Well, I would say I know I had it cranking pretty good when I did the Arnold Classic. So I would say probably four, four years ago, I think, okay. would okay. be my guess. Probably about like four years ago. But um, And that turned into a great tool. But um, 
the YouTube man, I've worked really hard on that in the past year and a half and it's growing. And it's funny because everybody sees all the growth with that and, and the Instagram and, and they, they're like, Oh man, you made it your way up there now. But I feel like I'm still so far behind. Mm. I feel like, man, there's just, I'm not getting out to enough people. There's just not enough people to know what's going on. So it's never enough for me. You know, I always feel like I need to do a better job. I got to get better information out there. And then the other thing I'm sure you notice with me is it's not just information. I like to kind of give people an inside a view of my life and, you know, my, my family and activities and having fun. I, I like to have a good sense of humor. And so it's not just information. It's like a glimpse into life so you can really connect with people because I think at the end of the day, uh, when you really connect with people, that's sort of really what makes a difference. There's always going to be a big group of people that go from person to person to person, whoever's the hottest. But when you can really connect with people, you can give them value. They can see that you're a human being just like they are. You know, I get up in the morning, I put on my pants just like everybody else. I work, you know, we started filming at nine o'clock today. We drove all over the city to film one video and we got back here at six o'clock. I mean, I do this. I, I'm just like everybody else, man. I just So it's nice for people to see that, that you're not up on some ivory tower. Yeah. You know, so um, anyways. Yeah, no, man, I like I, I like the, the component of how you are. You're, you're pretty real in terms of you're not trying to sugarcoat or, or try to pull the wool over your followers eyes about presenting yourself one way, but really not, you know, being that way. Like for when you did you were doing these videos, the skits, man, like with the one you did with Rashid, because I've had Mike yeah. on. He was down here in Sydney. You know, we got to connect. And little, and then you know, introduce. I feel like I know your little sons. You know, you, you, you yeah. they're they're popping up, um, you know, more and more. And yeah. think, like your personality, it really seems to me that the hard work, like the foundation phase of earning credibility, you've already built that. That's your body of work. You know that now. It's like you're almost you're able to pay the fruits of your labor with showing these people your personality. And I think that that is kind of like where some people struggle they're afraid to give it away and with you you give us so much well honestly man i enjoy it too i mean we have a lot of fun and <laughs> sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't really feel like work we're enjoying ourselves and um you know but i i just think that there is that portrayal portrayal on social media about people like to have this specific image and i've had people coaches will call them will say john you're really messing up your instagram it should be all coaching you should have all explaining how to do exercise videos and i was like man that is boring like hmm. like that's cool if you want to do that and i know people that do that but i get really bored seeing that stuff like what kind of hmm. person are you? you know that's what's interesting to me what kind of person are you you know you mentioned mike rashid really good dude i really enjoy talking to him that's a good honest guy i like i like getting to know him so you know, I just, um, you know, the thing that's never let me down, Johnny, is just being myself, man. It's never let me down. Every time I try to please everybody and um, I try to, I, I like, I kind of venture off the path and my heart is telling me, don't do that, don't do that. It backfires on me every time. If I just, if I just follow my heart, you know, like, for example, my training, everybody calls it mountain dog training. You know, that was just a weird thing that started happening because I love mountain dogs. So I was on forums years ago and I was under the name Mountain Dog. That was that was just a reference to a dog breed that I like. I like Bernese Mountain Dogs. And then, I, the, you know, I started getting a little bit more well known and people started saying, man, you need to change the name of that. Like people aren't going to be able to search you on the Internet or they'll literally come up with pictures of Bernese Mountain Dogs. And people were telling me that they're like, you got to change that. And I was like, ah, I don't really want to. And, you know, it's fine now, right? It's fine. Mm. And, you know, with something personal, you know, I, <clears throat> I ventured into the supplement business and, you know, I like, supplement.com. Yeah. I got that up. Yeah. It's been, um, it's been interesting. It's a tough business, but I came out with some really good products and I had some names that I thought were really cool. Arc reactor, for example, is a pre-workout mm. and, um, people convinced me to kind of change the labels and do some different things. And I, I didn't feel like it was the right thing to do, but I went ahead and did it and it didn't help the business at all. Um, so that was a kind of a frustrating thing for me. I mean, the formulas are still the same. It's still the same, same great products, but 
it didn't help the business. And I was told, oh, it'll help your business. And I should have just followed my heart. And that's generally, Johnny, what I find with everything I'm doing, man. If I just follow my heart, it usually doesn't lead me astray. I usually, it usually everything works out for the best. It's when I start letting people convince me that something else, it's not to say I'm not open for advice or things like that. I have mentors that I trust. I have some very good mentors, actually. Um, the guy that owns best, uh, best bar ever. Uh, well, it's a different company now, but, um, he's, he's still, with the, the company that owns metrics, nature's bounty actually owns best bar now, but the guy who started that company is a really good friend of mine, a mentor and, and Dave Tate out of elite FTS. You probably oh, yeah. know Dave. Yeah. Um, he's a very good mentor friend of mine too. Really good friend. When I, and those guys, I listen to them. They've never let me wrong, but I just feel like, man, when I follow my heart, it, uh, it always works out for the best. Yeah, that intuition. So I'm currently reading. Um, Glad. Do you know Malcolm Gladwell? Have you heard? Of, yeah. He, uh-huh. Yeah. He, you know, outliers. But he has this one blink, and and literally on. I, I I'm the type of guy to read a book and then I end up giving it away, and then I have to rebuy it and then I get pissed. I'm like, shit. I gotta stop giving books away, man. But yeah. Blink is about tapping into that intuition. It's it talks about that for following your heart. That that we live in such a society to where. We're almost created and built to second guess that that intuition of ours um, because of all of the external chaos going on. We we literally when people say I lost touch with who I am, that that's exactly what's happening as a society. With you understanding and noticing that that is a strength of yours, when you follow your heart, this allows other doors to open up. Do you think that this started to happen um, once you became a father? Uh, you know, ha- was having kids anything to do with that? Was this something that naturally occurred through your own maturation? Man, that's a great question. Um, I think it's always been there. I've always kind of been a little different. Um, you know, I go back all the way to junior high school. You know, I competed when I was 13 years old when I did my first show. But even back then, uh, in study hall at school, I the, like I would get passes to go to the gym to run around to do run laps or I would get a pass to go to the little tiny weightlifting room there where they had a Nautilus machine all the, the multi you know the bench press shoulder press like you know that machine I couldn't even sit in um I couldn't even sit in study hall nobody else would do that I always just wanted to be a little different I always just liked doing different stuff I always liked you know I'd get home from a really hard wrestling practice I would eat dinner then I put on my sweat clothes and I'd go out and I'd run for another hour. And um, I didn't really care what other people were doing. I always just wanted to push myself. And um, I think a large part of that was I had a really good grandmother that raised me. There was a big part of me that always wanted to make her proud of me. So I worked really, really hard. And that just kind of always stuck with me. Um, I've had some periods in my life where I kind of was a goof off. I went to a period of college where I was a little bit of a goof off. But by and large... I've been pretty disciplined and I didn't really care what other people thought. You know, I was the guy that in college when they tried to play jokes on me, I didn't really care. It didn't bother me. So they just didn't bother. They're like, well, it doesn't make you mad. So we need, we'll move on to the next person. Were you in a yeah. black fraternity? I was. Yeah. Yeah. So that down it, I mean, see where we come from in Ohio. I mean, you're, you're a Cincinnati guy. Um, the college I went to initially was by Cincinnati. It was called Wilmington college. Uh-huh. Now I live in Columbus, which is about an hour, about an hour from there. But where were you, where'd you spend those formidable like years of high school? Washington courthouse, which is about an hour South of where I am now. It's actually on the way to Wilmington to that first college that I went to. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I grew up, you know, I, I'm from Youngstown and I grew up in Northeast Ohio. So when it took me to leave Ohio to leave that part, cause some Ohio is all farm people here, Ohio. And they're like, oh. but I grew up in straight up kind of like, Urban. Dude, you were in, you were in gangster land, man. For sure, man. And and that's <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. And, and with you being in the black fraternity, and like it took me to leave Ohio when I moved to California when I was 24 to realize and actually see what like real racism was. Because where I come from, where skin color wasn't a thing. It was like we're all on the same page. You treat me how I want to be treated. I'll treat you kind. And we're boys, right? Yeah. You're talking about you've always done things your own way. Being an American, too, and, you know, you're in a black fraternity, that alone is a microcosm. I mean, because look at Hollywood when they do the movies, like the the cliche, stereotypical, like the black frats. You got the Kappas, you got the Alphas. There's never any white boys in that in those frats. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that, that alone, I mean, says a lot, at least me knowing how you grew up in that space, about you really, I think it's really important for us not to 
worry about what people view and judge us. I think that's why you have so many of these things and you've been so successful because you've literally carved that own path, your own way, the way you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny, man. I went to a, a rush party in college and I so didn't even know. Step. I think we talked about this. Not before. only can I step, do actually. Do a video, man. You've got to do I, an Instagram video. I have a picture um, on my computer here of me leading our step show when I crossed over. I'll send it to you. Dude, send it to me. And also, I'd love, man, you covered a couple good things. I want, Hopefully, I don't forget. But <laughs> the stepping thing, do you still remember how to do it? I'm sure I could pick it up real fast. I, I remember the song that I had. See, I was the shortest guy in my pledge class. So I was at the front of the line. Yeah. So I had to lead the I had to lead the line into the cafeteria. I had to lead the whole thing. Wow, dude. Yeah. And then, that, it's powerful. I mean, that alone shows. So I, I just turned I turned 36 in April, and I still feel like I'm 12. And what I'm what I'm working on as I mature and keep developing is allowing those things to to show out and flow through in my either new relationships or people have known me or even social media of like, be be who I am. You know, be comfortable in my past and not shy away from things such as that. Like, you know, yeah. being able to step. I think that's the coolest thing, you know, disregarding what color of skin you are. Like being able yeah, to it was, I think it's <laughs> dope. <laughs> it probably took him a lot of coaching to, to, to get oh, me to do it right. It's like but, anything. It's like yeah. anything, though, man. No one's born good at anything. <laughs> Yeah, man, we we did it. I did it. I led the line, and uh, I remember tapping my my stick and and leading the chance and everything. It was pretty fun, man. It, I tell you what, man, when I crossed over, I had respect across the uh, campus. Yes. And you were an athlete too. You really you really changed. I mean, this is part of my own ignorance. But when I first spoke to you, when you were telling me that you were a sprinter, and and you know your height, I had to go back and research. There's a guy that I learned from, uh, uh, Buddy Morris. As he yeah, but he's a friend of mine. He's out in Arizona. Yeah, he's a, he's, from, he's a Western PA guy, though. He's from yeah, right he's from I'm Pennsylvania. From. He used to be yeah. a bodybuilder in Pennsylvania. Yeah, he, he was also a sprinter, though. And I, I when he was younger, and yeah. when you said you were a sprinter, and that, I never told anyone this, but that used to be my biggest excuse of why I didn't, why I wasn't good at running or, or track, because I always thought, because I was short. And I was like, oh, I'm just short. That's why I'm not, uh, you know, that was the thing that held me back. Like I played quarterback, two guard, baseball. But then when you said that, you know, sprinters are either short and compact and dynamic or either long, it just had me thinking on a different level of like, man, how many other things have I created in my own mental space that are excuses that I kind of like formed as like realities that are just bullshit because it's my own insecurity? Yeah. Um, we do that all the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've seen any of my videos in the last year, but I've been putting out some videos showing my vertical leap and things like that. Oh, yeah. Will Compton. And was it Compton? That you had? Yeah, I was training yeah. with Will, and I had some people who were like, wow, like, you can <laughs> see the look on their face. They're like, did you really just do that? You out-jumped them. Yeah, I can jump, man. I can jump. And people are like, you know, you're 5'6". I think I'm actually 5'7", but you're 225, and you can jump like that? And I'm like... Yeah, man. I mean, I still, I still got a little bit of juice in these legs, man. Atta boy, that's crazy. You know. Yeah. So, um, I, I was, um, I've always liked. This is what I liked about powerlifting when I was in it. I've always liked that athletic, explosive training. Mm. And you know, it just so happened that I ended up doing bodybuilding training for most of my life because I've, I've been a bodybuilder. But I really like the science and the application of what we do with athletes you know, developing a lot of power, developing a lot of force. And I really, that's why I really liked when Will came down. Cause I got to like, man, I love this stuff. And, and now with my kids, I get to teach my kids that kind of stuff. And, you know, and, and I have a couple of friends that are really good at that stuff too, that I'll, you know, when you see me putting those little videos of my boys up on Instagram, yeah. stories, I got a couple coaches that send me like, Hey, make sure he does this, this, and this. So I really like that whole athletic pursuit too. And training like an athlete, um, despite how I look, I actually enjoy that stuff a lot as well. Are you doing anything uh, for your own personal um, training? Like, how are you still developing in ways? Uh, for instance, like what I've adapted since last year is really fallen in love and become addicted to just the heavy bag. Just for only one reason, to increase my cardio, to increase yep. my endurance. It's always been kind of a hole in my game. And I've just found that that has been spilling over, though, in a benefit in other areas of my life, that sort of discipline, learning. 
Are you doing any sort of in the last, since we spoke learning or what maybe kind of challenging yourself, your physical manifests in any new ways? Well, here's the thing. Like I love to push myself. I, um, Put a video up the other day where I was hack squatting six plates in a court. I saw it. You're a madman. I saw it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And here's this, here's the part of that you didn't see. The next day, man, my back was killing me. So here's I like so I like to really push myself, but it's a it's a I gotta be so careful, man, because my body, just like it or not, I mean I'm I'm a little beat up. I'm 46 years old. I'll be 47 in April. So I got to be careful. So the challenge I have with myself is how do I train really hard, but not hurt myself? Mm. Right. So that's my challenge. Like, you know, I'm doing that hack squat and I'm like, I'm not going to get weak. I'm not going to get weak. I'm going to stay strong. I'm going to stay strong. So I do that. And it's like, that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy. And then the next day, man, my back is hurting. And yeah, it's not man. because I did anything wrong or anything popped. It's just that load, man. Like I can't squat with a barbell on my back now. When I stopped squatting, doing barbell squats, it was very tough for me mentally because I just loved squatting. I loved mm. it. But yeah, the reality people. is, I mean, and, and I think most people can relate. It's a fun exercise. But when I stopped, um, it, was, it was mentally, man, it was like a big roadblock for me. And, uh, you know, then I saw, well, my legs aren't going anywhere. As long as I'm doing some leg presses, some hack squats, I'm actually not losing any size in my legs. So... But I think there's a certain point where you put a heavy bar on your back and you load your spine. I think that risk versus reward turns into more risk than it is reward. Yeah. So, you know, I have things like that now. Like I can't do a deadlift off the floor. It feels like it's going to rip my lower back in half. And so I'm like, okay, well, I can do some rack pulls done a certain way. So I'm always trying to find ways that I can continue to push myself. Because a lot of guys my age will say, well, I can't train legs anymore. I can't squat. I'm like, dude, there's tons of stuff you can do. You know, or yeah, my shoulders are banged up, so I can't really train my chest anymore. I'm like, no, there's all kinds of chest exercises you can do that don't load your delts real hard. That's right, but, man. You know, so that's 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 the challenge I have now, Johnny. It's it's how can I work hard and stay in one piece and continue to work hard. So there's a lot of um, mental thought that goes into what I'm doing. Yeah. And then sometimes I get crazy and I push myself really hard and I'm really sore. I'm really aching the next day, and it's not like a muscle sore. It's like a like I got dropped out of an airplane and landed on the ground sore. <laughs> yeah, like you know? your, your whole nervous set, nervous system, musculoskeletal. Um, I would love this. So when when people ask and message me when I do like early promos of these videos of these conversations uh, with people like yourself, I always talk about your program design, the programming component of like you're like the master it, it, from that perspective. I think I could use maybe correct me if I'm wrong if you haven't done this already. But I think myself, and I'll speak for the whole industry, especially a coach who takes pride in programming and helping people individually, is that maybe is there some sort of book or manual that that is together for that sort of like adjustment training? All right, you know, you have this injury. It doesn't mean you have to avoid or neglect that movement, but we could do it this way. What you just explained, like maybe just a whole list of newer kind of variated programs that you work around an impingement or an injury or f and not just totally neglect it. Man, I don't think there's anything like that right now. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm sure you could just brainstorm. I mean, like, it'd be, oh, I do that, that, and that. I do that, that, and that. I, yeah. I think the, the industry could, could value that because I see too many times. One of the things I preach to my clients now, I'm strictly gen pop. You know, a lot of down here in Sydney, the fitness industry is really, really popular because the economy allows the average person to spend money on their health and wellness. So I'm very grateful for that. A lot of my clients are women who are corporate, um, nine to fivers, 40 plus who need to lose weight, just trying to get stronger. And the mm -hmm. one thing, the message I have to them all the time is the fact that just because you've either never done something, had an injury, sore, inflamed in an area, does not mean we're going to avoid that area. We're going to strengthen around it you know, ensure that you're not going to get injured because there's a difference and we're going to move forward because then it becomes a mental thing. You know, you're walking right. around thinking you're injured. All right, you're going to be injured. But if you're thinking right. you're still, you're thinking you're still learning, then you're still growing. So I think that there's too much emphasis right now in our industry on specifically like hitting home runs or scoring touchdowns. Like what's your PB or blah, 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 and not enough focus on 
all right, how can we navigate, maneuver through those waters of maybe like getting older, um, you know, injury, that sort of thing? Well, here's the thing. I firmly believe this. Like, I, I believe that you have to push yourself hard. I believe that at the end of the day, if you're not a genetic freak, you have to be the person that really works hard. Now, that comes with a price. If you're working really hard, there's a good chance you're going to have strains and you're going to get some irritations. So then the challenge becomes, how do you work around that? How do you solve those issues? You know, I mean, I've strained everything you can possibly strain, I think. Um, but I've also learned how to work around that kind of stuff. I'm also a big believer in different therapeutic techniques. I love ART. I love MAT. Um, and actually, when I was in Australia, the last seminar I did, uh, I think I did one last year in Australia, in Melbourne. Um, I had a lady do fascial stretch technique on me. And that was the first time I'd ever had that done. And it's, that's not real. It hasn't really caught on over here. <clears throat> and it was really good. It was was she using cool. an instrument? No, it was um, just the way she was moving my joints around and doing stuff. It was okay. very, it was new. It was brand new to me. Okay. And um, so then I came here and I, and I was getting ready to go to Dallas, Texas to do a seminar. And it turns out in the gym, there's a guy, his name's Patrick. They call him Patrick the Punisher. He's actually very well known. He was an expert in that. So he put me through uh, an hour before I had to go to the airport. So now I have been having, I've, I've had a perpetually strained adductor groin like for years I've had to fight it. And a lot of times I'm wearing wraps around my groin and people think I'm doing occlusion training. I'm like, no, I'm just trying to not blow my adductor off. So anyways, uh, limited range of motion at the bottom end of a squatting type motion. Um, really had to be really careful. So I, I, this guy works with me for an hour. I get back here the next day it's leg day. So I get on a V squat machine. I go all the way down to till the machine bottoms out. And I felt like I still could have went another four or five inches Wow. Uh, the, the pain in my adductor was completely gone. And I would say it stuck for like three months mm. and I felt great. And I've never had like, so anyways, what I'm saying, and I get deep tissue work done every Tuesday for ever since 2003. So for 15 years straight, I've had deep tissue work done every Tuesday. So it's for me, it's, um, I, I got to train. I gotta be careful when I train, but I also invest a lot of money into different kinds of treatments and keeping my body working because I think that's a pretty good investment. For sure. Uh, you know, I think that's a good place to put my money is into trying to stay healthy and trying to be able to move. And I think that's part of why I can do those jumps and things like that is because I've, I've at least tried to keep my body semi-healthy, even though I'm pushing hard, I'm at least doing some stuff to keep it in one piece. John, are you familiar? Um, you know, I stopped assuming many years ago, so I'm not trying to act like you, but you know, it's Dr. Stuart McGill. I actually just had him work on my back a month ago. Oh, dude, what, that guy, he's like my man. He's like a spirit animal. I first met him two years ago and, you know, I sat down with him, learned from him. And he just blew me away by teaching me like, and guy's not familiar with Dr. Stu. He literally wrote the book on biospinal mechanics. But yeah. his whole, his whole um, area of research of just hanging, uh, like with a pronated grip to decompress the spine. And then I do that in mornings. Every day, man. So what I've noticed, I do it. I do it every day. And then, did you see the study on um, posture relating to life expectancy? No. Uh -uh. Yeah, very fascinating stuff. So, and then the study, the research breaks it down systematically on why. And it talks. It goes everything from when our shoulders start being kyphotic, and then our spine starts bending. It starts to mess with blood flow, oxygen, and then that obviously has a related effect to cognition to our brain. And so just yep. to, to combat that, also the decompression of the lower spinal cord when we're hanging like that, yep. it, it, it's been a, you know, playing football and, and baseball so many years in boxing. It's been the last few years, I've had zero joint shoulder issues. Just I, I attribute it to just hanging. I am. Um... I've been hanging myself. Uh, I, I like it. And I do in the morning. I got his, in fact, um, I know I got his book like right here. I was just reading it yesterday. Yeah. Did you actually go up to Canada? Um, or did yeah, you know, I was, was he in Ohio. Well, we were both speaking at the Swiss symposium. Okay. And I was having some pain in my thoracic uh, vertebrae, you know, from, typing you know doing all this kind of stuff yep and um so he looked at it he did a couple things gave me a couple tips and 
within a couple of days it was feeling better. But um, so I, I think I've read his book, The Back Mechanic. I think I've read it maybe three or four times. Yeah. But I get up in the morning and I, you know, I, I that stand works. up straight. I lift my rib cage. I, I do that every morning. That's, that's actually when I get out of bed. That's actually the first thing I do. I stand there. I lift my rib cage and I get my shoulder, my arms up, rotate my arms, pull my shoulders back. And um, yeah, Stu's an awesome dude. Yeah, last time we spoke, you all, and this is where, man, you mentioned about how you see the value of social media. And I just did a post on people who talk negatively and make excuses about, oh, technology is the end of humanity and social media is terrible. And it's like, it's not. It, you, they're just using it wrong because yeah. I, I, I've really, on my, since I've been on this journey for about three years of learning from people like yourself, I've really been able to identify and highlight who I need not to hang out with and who live near me and then just take what I learn through conversations like this. And when we spoke in April, you, you talked to me about, um, I have it in my notes right here, Dr. Dr. Shaw, no, uh, Scott Stevenson, Fortitude Training. And I wanted you to talk about the seminar, I think February 28th, when the Arnold is going on in Ohio. Um, Cause I've been, he's a PhD and he, Talk about that guy, or maybe is he is he close with you? Is he one of your buddies? He is. He is. Um, so, so we like did that. A circle like your circle. I mean, you got guys like Stu working on you, and guys like Scott Stevenson. Man, it's it's a cool. You thing. know what's crazy is I never even really think about it, but I am very blessed, man. I mean, you know, when you got Scott as a friend, Dave Tate's one of my best friends. I mean, I, I'm very. I actually, I don't know if you know Doctor Serrano or not. What's your now, last name? Dr. Serrano, Eric Serrano. Mm. Eric is one of the most sought out doctors in the world. The guy lives an hour or he lives a mile and a half down the street from me. So, um, and he's a really good friend of mine. I, he, he, he was an invitation only doctor and I got to start seeing him in 1999 and we've just become really good friends. He would be a great guy to have on your show, by the way. For he's sure. a, he is incredibly, incredibly bright. He's way ahead of the curb with, you just have to talk to him. But I'm very blessed, man. I have a lot of good friends around me. Scott, um, I met through competing. Scott's a high-level competitor, and uh, we competed nationally with each other. And um, <clears throat> just a good guy, man. He's just a really good guy. He's a brilliant PhD. We've done a number of seminars together. We did... Um, Last year at the Arnold, we did the same thing. On Thursday before the Arnold Classic, we we got a room that held about 50 people down one of the hotels downtown. And it sold out, like, immediately sold out. So we tried to get a bigger room. So this room we have this year will hold about 100 people. Um, but Scott is an expert, man. I mean, he's another guy, if you ever talk to him, he is really, really sharp, really sharp. And just a good guy with a good heart. I don't really care how smart someone is, man, if they're kind of a mean-spirited person. Yeah. I tend to kind of uh, like people who have good hearts and good intentions, too. So you'll notice kind of the circle of people I hang out with are just good people. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in that the kind of people you hang out with is eventually who you are. You, you act like the group you hang out with. I'm a big believer in that. So I figure with guys like Scott, Dr. Serrano, Dave Tate, as long as I'm hanging around good people like that, I should be okay. Yeah, it's great advice, man. They your net your net worth is your network, and it's it's advice that I think a lot of us could use. It, it's said that, that when you learn stuff like that, you're always like, "Damn, man, I wish somebody had told me that when I when I was younger." I mean, there's some 20 year old who's who's hearing that saying the same thing it, yeah. it, about about that sort of thing. And it's I think that intelligence, though, you, you said that you, you know if somebody's a smart person but they're mean. Or they're just a bad person, or they have that manipulation in them, or they want to get things out of people. Um, I think the person, though, who might not be book smart but has a great heart, I think that's intelligence as well. I think that's something that that uh, the older I get, I think there's more value there. It's greatly underestimated, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it goes into all different walks of life. You know, in the business world, when I used to work at J.P. Morgan Chase. I was running five $10 million projects, the biggest projects at the entire corporation. And you, you know, who the, you know, who the dumbest guy in the room was technically it was me, <laughs> but I was, the whole thing. you know, but I got good people around me. I had good people in the training department, good people in it, you know, all the, the people I had around me on the team were really, really good people. And I knew that if I had sharp, 
good people that could relate well with others and work well with others, I knew at the end of the day, the project would be a success. So I wasn't always looking for the, the nerdiest, geekiest dude if he was a jerk. You know, it was like, let's find the people who are really good to work well together so you have a good team. You know, when you get that good teamwork, you can do a lot of good things. Yeah, did you get a chance to check out the documentary on Ronnie on Netflix? I did, yes. Man, it was, I mean, me, I never met Ronnie. It's a guy I'd like to, I'd like to talk to and learn from. But it, it kind of hit me in a weird way. It kind of left me a little... Cause he's a sweetheart and it was really heartbreaking to see that. I don't know how much of that was the production of like, it showed him in the cane the whole time and then just struggling to get to the, the gym, but that consistency. And you talked earlier about, you know, the, the hack machine and your, and your, you know, spine hurting it. The first thing I thought of is what do you think though, that the same thing that's why you're successful and not, you're not a one trick pony man and everything you do and all, you know, as a bodybuilder as well, having that work ethic and commitment, almost craziness. Like you see all the champs have Cutler, Coleman, Arnold, yeah. Zane, the list goes on and on to be able to have that sort of chaos, which leads to success and not allow it to totally consume you after to just break you, to be able to like maneuver it into other areas. Was that a struggle of yours? Because you see a lot of guys in your industry, man, in your sport, and your craft to once those lights go off, once, you know, once, yeah, man, talk a little bit about that. Maybe share some insights or advice on how you've dealt with that. Well, it's not easy. Um, I mean, even social media for me wasn't easy, but <clears throat> I tend to look at everything as a challenge. And I have this weird thing in my head <clears throat> that always says, well, if all these people can do it, surely you can do it. it almost like when I became a father. So I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I'm going to fail miserably at being a dad. I, I mean, I really, I thought that over and over. And then I, you know, then you see all these other people that are good dads. I'm like, if they can do it, surely I can do it. Like, surely I can do it. And I kind of have that mentality with all this stuff. Like, man, if these guys can figure out how to do Instagram, I can figure it out. It's not that, it can't be that hard. <clears throat> so then I just attack it. I just go after it, whatever it is. You know, I just kind of, and I'm not, I mean, if you look at my story, success has never come easy for me. Yeah, man. It's been, you know, I mean, people see the pro card part of it and it took that me six That surgery though, that, 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 dude, man, when I learned about that scar you told me about in your abdomen and yeah. you ended up, yeah, sorry to cut you off. No, that was a good example of, of you know, it could have been very easy for me to go, okay, well, that's it. You know, I'm done. But um, I don't get deterred too easily. And, um, you know, that kind of carries over into all walks of life. I, I, um, I, I make mistakes just like everybody else. But um, when I make those mistakes, I typically learn from them. And, you know, there's uh, people ask me all the time, every podcast I do, you know, what could you go? What would you change if you go back? And I wouldn't change anything. I mean, because I'm very happy with where I'm at now in life and, where I'm at now is a product of all those mistakes I made partially too. You know, if I wouldn't have made all those mistakes, then I couldn't have learned and I couldn't become the person I am now. So I don't have any issues with any mistakes that I mean, and I've done some dumb stuff too, but you know, it's just people. Um, I always wonder, man, here's the, here's the question I have for you. I always wonder when the, the people, some people just have this relentless work ethic and I always wonder, are they born with it? Or did something happen in their life that gave it to them? Because I don't know. I don't know. Because I kind of feel like I was born with it. I kind of feel like from day one when I was a little kid, I had that instilled in me. Yeah. And then you see other people that necessarily don't necessarily have that story. And then you see some people that, man, this is one of the reasons why I personally was not a good trainer um, in person at a gym. You know, when I was training people actually in a gym, I didn't have, like, I would try to get them motivated. And I would try so hard. And then they would come in and they just, okay, I didn't do anything you told me. And I would say, come on, man, we got to try. We got to do better. And it literally sucked the life out of me. And that's actually why I quit training people in a gym. And I took a corporate job because I got so frustrated that people didn't have motivation. And I thought, how can you not have motivation? You know, I got all this motivation. How can you not have motivation? But the reality is, is a lot of people don't have motivation. And I was just wondering, is that, is that how they're born or, or their environment? Here's what I think. I think that 
you're not motivated. I think you are driven. I think motivation is external. People who who are looking for motivation, they're looking to pay thousands to go watch Tony Robbins speak. They're looking to read something Gary V wrote and it's fleeting, it's passing. It's like we're fishing without without fishing poles and you grab the fish out the lake and it slips out. And that's motivation. Those the, the, the scales left behind your hand. But if you're driven, that's intrinsic. That's internally. That's that is something that um, you know, I don't think you could teach. And I think that frustrated you. I think that people were coming to you and I, I deal with that as well. The being driven component has to show up when we're younger, I think. Like my thing was I was just afraid. I was afraid of my dad. Not physically. He was a six foot four Czechoslovakian man. And, you know, they, his friends were all called him Mr. T, played football. I, I just didn't want to disappoint him. And I even I went through like 10 years, John, in, in California of not doing shit, man. Like working in bars, drinking every night, getting into fights, being just miserable. Just so. But I always knew I would go to bed at night knowing and waking up knowing, wishing that somebody or something would show me or tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. And it, it took me to realize that nobody was going to show me or give me that, that I had to create that. And I, like, I think that a lot of us get stuck with the motivation of the external people have to give you it and not, it comes down to not taking ownership, like own your shit. If you want to change, if you want results, if you want to do something that's worth anything, somebody talking good about, then you have to create that. And, and I think that's the biggest difference, at least for me, that's how I compute the differences because I hate motivation. I like yeah. the worst thing that my buddies back home tell me, Johnny, I saw a post, you motivate me. I'm like, fuck man, don't tell, I don't like that. I, that's not what I, I'm trying to do. Like I, yeah. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn and teach and help people. And I think the word motivation gets a lot of people stuck. It's <clears throat> so it's funny you say that because yesterday I was going through Facebook and I was getting all these ads from Grant Cardone, all these people. Yep. And, and I was hiding all of them. Hide them. Yeah. <laughs> And it was saying, you know, it asked you why. And I would say this content is not relevant to me. But I watch those and I think, man, this is just I'm listening to what there's this particular one that he was he was saying. And I was just like, I don't want I mean, this stuff. It's I don't want to say it's all it's external. all external. It's all external. So I was literally just going through hide and hide, hide, hide. I don't want to see these ads. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's built on it's built on objects that and there's danger in that. Um, it's crazy, man. Like I remember going to college, I had like a, a little, a couple a small amount of time left on a scholarship. And I go to the, the guidance counselor and I ask her what classes do I need to take to finish on time? And I just luckily finished with a psychology degree and all my twenties, I was like, man, why did I do that? I would never use it. And then it, those, what I learned pops up in stories like this now. And I think a lot of our issues societally, and I'm not trying to sound self-righteous here, I'm just speaking from experience, is when those videos like that are popping on your screen and people are um, trying to preach and sell objects to people like, you know, work for this so you could have this, or if your bank account isn't saying this, or if you don't have this followers, that's built on looking up. That, that perspective is never built on looking forward. It's always yeah. up like that. It's something or someone else who has what you don't have. And it has to go internal. It has to go intrinsic. It has to not be about things that we could touch. It has to be about things that we could feel. Like, how does something make you feel? And I think so yeah. many people are afraid of that emotion. Well, and there's always going to be people that have more stuff than you. So people get on this rat, this rat race. Well, I got to have the better car. I got to better the better house. And the one yesterday I was watching, he said, um, how much do you have in your savings account to this kid? And this kid said $60,000. And I was like, wow, that's I mean, <laughs> yeah. when I was in college, I had like 15 bucks yeah. Yeah. and I'm thinking this kid's doing pretty good. He goes, well, you're broke. And you could see this puzzled look on this kid's face. And he's like, you're broke, man. You don't have nothing. And I was thinking, I, I don't know that I agree with that, man. I mean, you might be the entrepreneurial expert as we call it, but I don't think I agree with that. And then, you know, I've had some, um, some life experiences, like when I got sick and I had to have my, and I was in, I woke up in ICU. I was very close to death. Was that colitis? Or no, it wasn't or colitis. I, I had a vascular, it was a vascular disease. It was, uh, so here's a lot of big words for you. Idiopathic. Yeah. Myo 
hyperplasia of the mesenteric vein. So I woke up in ICU and you get a, like a little different picture on things. It's like, hey, you know what? Maybe actually enjoying my relationships with people, maybe that's the stuff that I should be worried about. The relationships I have with people and things like that, as opposed to what I can buy or, you know, you know, hopefully people don't need to get hit on the head like I did. But I do remember the change in frame, the frame of reference I had changed totally as to what a big deal was. You know, at the corporate world, I would think something would happen. There would be an issue with a project and I would think it was a very big deal. And I would go, you know, get all worked up about it. When I woke up in ICU and then later, eventually I went back to work. People were like, wow, you're not really upset by this at all, are you? And I was like, no, we'll fix it. It's not a big deal. I had a totally different perspective. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I have the kids, obviously. So I remember back when I was training over 200 people online and I basically would work all day and all night. Like, I mean, I have very little sleep. And my kids are born and I was like, you know what? They're going to be grown up before I even know what's happening at this current pace I'm working at. So I cut my hours way down. Um, I cut my clientele way down so I could spend time with them. I lost, I cut my income down. I mean, I'm talking six figure reduction, but you know what? I was 10 times happier the next year. I was so much more happy. This year, I, um, I mean, I worked hard, but I spent like I missed, I went to all their football practices. It was an awesome football season. I'm like, man, this is the stuff that's making me really happy. You know, I still work. Don't get me wrong. I, you yeah. know, I still work hard, but there was a, a sense of what's really going to make me happy. It's, it's my relationship with my kids, my family, my wife. It's things like that. It's not just how much, what is, how much money can I accumulate as fast as I can. Yeah. Do your kids know what you do? Like, do they know, like, what who Mountain Dog is or no? Well, every time we travel, though, right? Well, every time we travel, people are asking for pictures. So, okay. Um, they, I think they have some clue. And, um, you know, the, the people on the football team, the coaches and all, they found out who I was. So they're all talking about all this stuff. And I'm like, man, come on, man. Ah, uh, it is. I mean, every single time I'm in an airport or I'm in other countries, or did people you expect talk. it? It still feels a little odd, not in a bad way. It mm -hmm. it only feels odd because I don't I don't feel like I'm. I mean, I don't feel like I'm some kind of celebrity. Like you'll never hear me say my fans. I okay. would challenge. I would <laughs> challenge anybody. I challenge anybody to find anything I've wrote where I said my fans. Yeah. LeBron has fans, right? I mean, Tom Brady has fans. Yeah. I mean, I have people that follow me, but I just don't – I like – you got to be a star to have fans. I'm not a star. I'm just some dude that's getting pretty well, old just training a lot. Well, I don't – well, what I would say about that indifferent is that LeBron and Tom Brady are only LeBron and Tom Brady because of the, the mass corporation that they've played behind. They've played with multinational businesses, which is the NFL and the NBA. Obviously, their God-given talent is extremely – beneficial but i think it's even more kind of unique to a guy that grew something organically without <laughs> without a corporate thing without a team strictly through a passion and then watching that body of work kind of you know you planted seeds 20 years ago 30 years ago they started growing they took time but you didn't stop you didn't yeah. put weed ki you didn't put weed killer on you kept watering and watering yeah. i think there's something more to that i like that guy a little more because there is no luck there's no like i Oh, you got lucky. No, there's no such thing as luck. There's taking a, there's taking advantage of opportunity, which your past kind of allowed you to do that. So I think it's I think it's kind of way more um, admirable. Well, I, pre I like that view. I like that view. <laughs> it's the way I mean, it, it's how I've always looked at like the person. Now, I play team sports. I love the team component. But you look at a guy like I mean, LeBron and Tom Brady are outliers. They're probably going to be successful, whatever they did, even if they didn't play sports. But some people could just be a product of the opportunity of somebody supporting them. I mean, I'm sure you didn't get the support that you always felt you deserved until you had built stuff by yourself first. It's like people then started seeing the value in John Meadows. And then, but you had already chopped enough wood to where most people would have stopped and then people wanted to help. So I think there's, that's a big difference. You know, what was always interesting to me is, you know, I had those surgeries in 2005 and I came back from them 
And those were truly life threatening. Like I was literally bleeding to death when they rushed me into surgery. And I came back from them. I was competing at a high level. You know, it was years later. It was years down the road. It actually took me, I think, seven years after that to be competitive again. But I did it after seven years. No magazines ever wanted to talk to me about it. And I always thought, man, that's, I feel like that's a pretty good story to share with people. But no magazines ever wanted to talk to me about it. They were like, no one ever said anything. And I always thought, man, I, that's a, I, you know, I, I remember, and this is no disrespect to Branch, Branch Warren. There's no disrespect to him at all. But I remember reading how he strained or tore his tricep doing something. I don't know if he was coming down the stairs or I don't know what it was. But he had all these awards for like this comeback this, comeback that. And I was like, okay, try getting your entire colon removed. Try having six surgeries. I feel like this is a little bit of a comeback story, you know, but uh, at some point I just said, you know what, these guys will never talk about it, forget about it. And so I just kind of brushed out of my mind. And then in 2015, then all of a sudden they're like, Oh, Hey, this is a good story. Now we want to talk about it. And I was like, Oh, now you come around. <laughs> I think it's because we're a lot of people are afraid of our own uh, mortality and you know, a torn tricep could kind of be, glamorize is you know non-life threatening people don't like going deep john man like that's why i call this show ungoogleable i call it ungoogleable because the things that matter the most to us you can't search for you can't take a pill you can't hire somebody you can't pay for a motivational chat to expect drastic improvements you already have everything internally you can't search for them and that's why I people don't want to people shy away from the fact that we're all going to die and because maybe you were so close and you, you know that you're the only one who knows how truly close you were to that next transition that I'm sure there probably weren't enough kind of candid writers or people with enough gumption to even tell that story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, time has flown, man. You and I could chat. I want to uh, one, one, I, your Instagram, what you post up, you never post something without intention. And I always read what you write, but you also rarely ever post kind of quotes like a screenshot. And I'm a quote guy, man. I love it. It's how I'm wired. I think it's thanks <laughs> to my mom, maybe. But I have it written down. You say you post this quote, this post once a year. There's only one way to avoid criticism. Do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. And then you yep. write about how, you know, people in our lives, people that you expect things from, maybe like to, to support you, and then they don't. And then people who kind of you, they weren't even on your radar, and then they just show up, they're present, and then they help you. Maybe share the kind of like the story deeper of why that means something to you. Well, many, many years ago, uh, Dave Tate and I were having one of our conversations and I mentioned a few names and um, I said, you know, I think these guys will be, you know, pretty good friends. They'll be good business partners. And Dave said to me that that uh, Dave said to me, one of the things you're going to find out in business is a lot of the people you think are going to be there for you aren't. And the people who you may not think uh, any, you may not think much of them all, those, there might be some of those people that surprise you. So Johnny, as the years have went by, there was people that I thought would um, support me. And I thought I had a really good relationship with, and then at the slightest sign of any, you know, anything negative, they poof, they disappear. But then I've had, but I've been very blessed. And then I've had other people that they'd come to bat for me, man. I mean, people that would take a bullet for me. And I was like, wow, like I didn't expect that out of that person. So it's just always interesting to me how quickly we think someone's going to support us and how quickly we are to say somebody else won't. You'd be surprised, man. Sometimes those people are, it's reversed, you know? And, um, so that's, that was a lesson Dave taught me. And to this day, even in the supplement industry, there were people who said, man, we appreciate everything you've done. We're going to, we're going to stand behind you. And now they're gone. Some of those people are gone. Mm -hmm. And then there were other people that I thought, oh man, they'll never really, we'll never really have a good business relationship with them or what have you. And they're, but they're awesome. They're awesome business partners. They're great people. So you just never know, man. You never know. So I'm, um, it's just always something I always have in the back of my brain. And, um, 
but I do I do like that uh, little thing I post once a year. That's literally like the only one I post like that, as you noticed. Mm. And um, I, I do like that because it's so easy to sit and criticize. And, you know, I used to get on forums more than I do now. And um, it's just a lot of criticism. People didn't like my ideas. And I'd be like, okay, that's fine. What's your idea? Well, I don't really have any, but I just know I don't like yours. And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, and then, you know, on my YouTube and on social media, you know, I get all the negative comments too. Doesn't bother me in the slightest. Doesn't deter me from anything. I just click on them. I block them or I delete them and I block them and I move on because, you know, I was talking to Jeff Nippard. You know, Jeff has done a really good job on YouTube. Young dude, a, savage. Good dude, man. I had this, I had a great conversation with him and he said, John, why do you do that? And I said, because when you get somebody on there that's just being nasty and rude, and then you get a couple people on there, people, people who come to that video, they won't want to comment. They'll just be like, you know what? This is a train wreck. I'm just going to move on. <clears throat> but if they see a good environment, oh, man, John answers questions. Like if you look on my YouTube, Johnny, look at my videos. I, I at least acknowledge, if not answer, every single reply that I see. That's dangerous, though, man. Reading the YouTube comments can be a dangerous game to play, man. It is if you let it bother you. But, um, <laughs> so You're an it's Ohio a guy through and through, man. <laughs> but I do, I do that. I go through twice a day. I go through all the comments. I click on community, and I see the comments, and I at least acknowledge them, and I read them all. I read them all. So Jeff was like, well, I wanted mine to be more just kind of authentic and just let everybody say what they want. And I said, that's what killed forums, Jeff, is – you get people who are negative. They destroy the forum. They destroy the, the the community, and nobody wants to be a part of it. That's why some of these big forums no longer have any pro bodybuilders coming on because every time a pro bodybuilder come on, they get nothing, but they just get attacked. Yeah. And I said, so I want my YouTube to be welcoming. I mean, the, I don't want the one bad guy to dissuade the ten other people that that um, actually need help or want help from commenting. And so I've tried to create. And it's interesting, the more I do that, the less people I have that are, you know, saying bad things, because I think I've kind of cultivated a very, in a very unique way, this really good atmosphere on YouTube. And, you know, and it's, I don't have any gimmicks or anything, and it's grown well over 100,000 in the past year. Um, so, I mean, I'm doing something right. And so, I, you know, that's kind of what that quote means. It's like the, the people that are sitting there that are criticizing, they're not doing anything. And who cares? Really, at the end of the day, who, who cares what they think? What should matter is your family, number one. We, what does your family think about what you're doing, your friends? You know, that's what really matters, you know. So anyways, um, that's just how I look at that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about the family and friends, man. It's the most important thing. And like I said, you can't buy those. You know, the, that's the real stuff. Hey, John, I got in the show notes for people listening. I got mountaindogdiet.com. I got granite supplements. Dot com. I also have all of your links for your social medias if people listening to this aren't following you. Is there anything I'm missing? Uh, we, we got the you got the seminar coming up at the Arnold Classic February 28th in Columbus, Ohio with Scott Stevenson. Before I let you go, is there anything else uh, that you want to share? Any upcoming news? Yeah, you got to check this out. On Apple and Android, I have the Mountain Dog Diet app now. And it is um, it's in the Play Store. Um it just launched like a week ago. And what I did was I took my member site, which had about eight years of content on it, and which is still going strong, by the way. And because my, my member site is more geared toward people who sit on a PC, um, but I wanted something for people for that was more self, cell phone friendly for people who use their phones. So um, it's got literally like eight years of data on it. And it's very organized. It's extremely organized. It's very professional. It took about six months to get all the data migrated, organized into libraries. There's different sections. There's nutrition. There's training. There's exercise index. There's a Q&A on there so that when people want to ask me a question, they put it in there. It comes to me. I answer every single question I get. But um, I just launched that. I'd love for people to take a look at it. It's um it's a really really good resource. Plus, it has a live feed of all my social media stuff. It just anything I do in social media, it comes up and people can see it throughout the day. Things that are coming up. So, um, I would love for people to check that out too. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Awesome, and that's on for Android and iOS. 
Yeah, it's on iOS and Android both. Yep. Okay, and then I could just find the links for that and just put it. In the actually, notes. actually, it's actually I just put a story up when I got home like two hours ago. So if you go to my Instagram story, there's a story on both of them right now. Okay. With a swipe up, with a swipe up link to both of them. Perfect, and I'll just add that in the show notes as well. Hey, man, um, I really appreciate you sharing space with me and doing this once again, man. There's so much value that you have to share, and you give so much. Um, you know, selfless energy away. I just want to say thank you. I appreciate it, man. I love it. I'll be in Sydney probably in uh, March. Oh, for real? You got to hit me up then. I'm trying to, I think, uh, do you know Eugene? Uh, no. T.O.? I've, I've seen the name. I've, I've he's seen a good the name dude. Online. Like, he's is he's he a good dude. He's a bodybuilder, right? I think he used to be. He's more of like um, a holistic, um, he's more of like a health guy. Okay. Okay. Um, Sharp guy. He's a really good friend of mine. And Eugene and I, I'm pretty sure we're finalizing details to do a Sydney seminar in March. Awesome, man. You definitely keep me in the loop. I'm right up. When they do these seminars, I live in my gyms right outside the city, like right in the heart of the CBD. So we'll definitely be in touch, man. Let me know. And then if you okay. do, you ha- do you have the details on that or is it still? Uh, uh, I don't have it yet, but I think it's almost done. So as soon as Eugene gets them to me, I'll shoot them over to you. Sounds great, man. And John, off of the record, um, do you want me to just pull a photo up from one of your websites to use as the marketing? Yeah, just pull a good one up, man. Whatever you think will, is a good Yeah, that's what I, I always tell people. I think my biggest strength as a person, friend, and coach is being able to highlight strengths in people. So a guy like yourself, you know your strengths. But a lot of people, they feel, you know, I like, I like making people feel good. I'll find a good one of you, man. Awesome. Um, Thank you very much. And, and then also, dude, this is off the record. You should definitely do Mountain Dog Radio, man. Like, even if, like, a podcast, you'd be shocked with, for one, you have the member site, you have the app, you have the YouTube following, the social media following. You could just look at it as as a, an expression tool. You know, yeah. you, like, like, you have a lot to say. You know, I don't even own a laptop. I do everything. I do, I do this show's being listened to 85 countries. I don't even know. I, I, I use the iPhone 8 now. I have another iPhone here recording the audio. When, like, when you're here in person, I'll have a film team with me, and I have microphones and that set up. But for the most part, I do all of my audio podcasts with just this phone, uploads to my podcasting site, and then, then it sends to all of it, Apple, iTunes, all that good stuff. And Mountain Dog wow. Radio, man, the people are waiting. Wow. Think about what a, it. What, how many, like, downloads do you get a month? So it, 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 it depends. Because I've – look, man, I'm kind of a nerd and – I got into coaching in the fitness game to help people. I didn't, so I don't have one specific niche. My followers aren't just about fitness. So I'm still, I have science guys, writers. Some episodes are like 70,000. Some episodes are like 5,000, but I'm only, I'm still building. We are in 85 countries though, which is crazy. And uh, I wrote, I wrote my first book. I signed with the publisher this past April it should be out within the next month out of New York City. It's called Unusable. Nice. Yeah, so I'm working on a second and third one with a, a publisher out of Sydney this time. But um, the podcast, though, man, in terms of like the networking, the communication, you be it, it's a beautiful tool to express ourselves and also get messages across to people who want to listen to them and meet more people, man. You could do it right well, now. I mean, you've been getting some awesome guests. I mean, I've been watching everything you're doing. I'm like, man, you're, ask, do- you're doing a good job. I just asked, man. It's it's one of these things that once I got, once I was able to get past that sort of like, you know, I'm from this town, inferiority. Like, my, I, I grew up with nothing, man. My parents were, we were on welfare, dirt poor. Like, I think my, like $5 an hour, like my mom used to make. And then yeah. that kind of. Once I went to college, I got a scholarship that kind of like, and I talk about this a lot when I do my recap. So people who listen to my show, I'm very upfront about that. When I was able to get past that mental blockage of like my past of being like, I'm not good enough and realize, yeah. oh, that that's a prison. That's a, that, yeah. that's, that's an excuse. Then I was comfortable enough with being able to, oh shit, I have the skills. I could learn from whoever I want to learn from. And a lot of people want to talk, man. And, and, and a lot of people want to learn. So I'm just fortunate. Yeah. Uh, you're doing awesome. Keep it up. All right, big dog, man. I'll, I'll email you the first copy when this comes out in a few days, and then you keep me posted on when you come to Sydney, all right? Okay. Sounds good. All right, brother. Be good. All right. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.